But I was sitting outside on the patio this morning, and I got to thinking about what Chuck's been preaching on, the Holy Spirit and the leading and the guiding and, and the working and, and the doing, uh, the, the law of the Lord and, and what he says and that sort of thing. So I, he took me to the end of each gospel. So we're going we're gonna to jump a little bit here, and I want you to join me and go with me as we go through the scriptures uh, that he's given me. Okay, we're in Matthew 28, starting in verse 16. Matthew 28, 16. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some were doubtful. Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, excuse me, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you to do. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. If you look in verse 18, when Jesus started speaking, he said, all authority is given to me. He has given us that authority. I could stand up here and give you the Greek and the definition of the terms, but I want you to go home this evening and take a look at that word authority and determine what it means to you. All authority has been given to me in heaven, he said, and on earth. All authority. And when you find that, that word authority and you determine what it means, you're going to find out that you've got a whole lot more than you thought you had. All right. That's what Matthew had to say when, on Jesus' last days here. Now, we go to Mark, chapter 16, verse 14. And afterward he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table, and he reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison it shall not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. For, uh, Mark 16, 14 through the end, through 20. Okay? Now we're going to cover a couple of times that Luke spoke of this. First we'll go to Luke 24. Okay, let's see. Start at um, verse 27. And beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. And they approached the village where they were going. This is him walking along. Uh, the road there with those the two, okay? Uh, he acted as though he would go further, and they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting uh, toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. And he went in to stay with them. And it came about that when he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And they arose that very hour and returned to Jerusalem, found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, The Lord has, all, has really risen 
and has appeared to Simon. And they began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized them by them in the breaking of the bread. And while they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst. And they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why, are you, why do you doubt? Arise in your heart. Why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were uh, still uh, could not believe, believe it for joy, they were marveling. He said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and bread, and he ate it before them. 44. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, interesting that he added, and the Psalms, must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. Verse 45. He opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. If you come across a scripture that you don't understand, ask him, what does this mean, Lord? He'll open your mind so that you understand. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the, from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And from there he was uh, raised from the dead, or uh, he rose to heaven. Okay. In John, he doesn't talk about a great commission that much. The end of John, in, in chapter 21 from uh, verse 15. He's speaking to Peter. He sets Peter aside. I, I think they can still, the others can still hear him talking to Peter, but he's directing his comments to Peter. Now there's some interesting words that are used here. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? In other words, do you love me more than these folks, the other guys? The word he uses for love is agapeo, agape. We're familiar with that term as God's love, the way God would love, with no conditions, no requirements. He loves without any recompense. He loves. And that's what he's asking him the first time around. Do you love me, agape? Peter says, I phileo you. You know that. It's a brotherly love. It's not the same. It's more of a fleshly love. Just a, a, a good, strong bond. And he said to him again, Son of John, do you agape me? Agapeo. And he said again, phileo. The third time he asked him, do you phileo? He's brought it down to Peter's understanding of what's going on. And I think at this point when he said that, when he changed the word, Peter understood what Jesus was talking about. So John doesn't speak of the um, commission, if you will. And that's where we're going. In Acts, and we're going to do several uh, verses in Acts here, uh, we know that Acts is written by Luke. He's speaking about that. In Acts 1, verse 4, uh, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard of from me, for John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. That's a key phrase. You will be baptized by the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And um, 
It has to do with salvation and power or empowerment. Um, then they ask him about uh, the, the kingdom, if it was going to be restored. And he says, verse 7, It's not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has, the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. If you'll notice in verse 8, if you take that whole thing together, you find out what they're going to receive and why they received it. Let me tell you right now, they did not receive it to speak in tongues. Okay? That wasn't the reason they received the power of the Holy Spirit. It was to be his witness. Okay? Although tongues was part of the gifting. All right. Uh, chapter 2 in Acts, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit was giving them utterance. What is this word tongues? Do you know what it is? Do you understand what the meaning of that word? Language. Known languages. Not gibberish. Not an angelic tongue. There is an angelic tongue. This is known languages. If you read in Corinthians, when Paul is speaking of the gifting after chapter 13, I think it's in 14. No, it's in 13. If, even if I speak in the tongue of angels, and that's the only time its tongues is identified with an angelic language, or of men, okay? So we have two different types of tongues. We have an angelic and a, and a human, it's known somewhere. They may not know it, but somebody did. Um, now, there were Jews in, in, living in Jerusalem, continuing on in verse 5, devout men from every nation under heaven, and when this sound occurred, the multitude came together uh, and were be be bewildered, because they were each one hearing them speak in his own language. Uh, and they were amazed and marveled, saying, what are, these are Galileans, and we go on, and it identifies 9 through 10, 11, the tongues that were spoken. Now, the point is not tongues. The point is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. If we remember, we think back, even Jesus himself, did not begin his ministry until he received power from on high. When Jesus became a man, he set aside his divinity. Not us. He did it on his own. And he became a man just like us. He had to be a man just like us to make that sacrifice for us. He didn't begin his ministry. He was in training for 30 years. And he went down to the river and was baptized in obedience to God's law, that, uh, that uh, baptism of repentance. Did he need to repent? No. Why did he do it? Because he was obedient to God. There's a lot of times that we are called to do things that we don't have to do. Why should I do that? I don't have to do that unless God called you to do it. That's called walking in obedience. Jesus came up out of the water. What happened? Spirit of God descended on him in the form of a dove. So we see the three together. We see Jesus. We hear the Father. This is my son whom I, whom I love. And we observe a manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove coming down and resting upon him. And that's a key word, upon him. Because when we're born again, we receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus, in the upper room, breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. So they received the Holy Spirit. But they hadn't been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that's the key. Before we go out to do something, 
We need to know how to do it. You need to know the mechanics of what it, you know, if you're going to cut down a tree, whether you're going to use a, an axe or a saw or a chainsaw or one of them big forest machines that just comes up and snips it off like toenail clippers. You've got to know how you're going to do it, the mechanics of what you're going to do. Now you've got to have the power to do it. If you're not empowered to do what you're going to do, you can't do it. You will not succeed. You have to be empowered. And that's what this baptism in the Holy Spirit is all about. God has called each one of us to do what? And I just read three samples out of the Gospels. What has he called us to do? Each one of us. Come on. What? Witness. Witness. Okay. Baptize. Baptize. Say again. Make disciples. This is what he's called us to do. Preach the gospel. Proclaim the gospel. Do you know what that is? Do you know how to do that? It's not standing on a corner, although for some it is, and standing up and preaching the word right out of that on a, on a sidewalk. It's your everyday, yeah, everyday life, your walk. Use words, too. <laughs> That's what we're called to do. But if you go out and he hasn't empowered you yet, What's going to happen to your words? They'll be in vain. Yes, yes. They'll just fall to the ground. But if he's empowered you, and you are walking in the spirit of that empowerment, when your words go forth, they're going to touch people's hearts. They are going to be changed one way or the other. We'll all be saved? No. No. Are we saving them? No. no. What are we doing? Yes, preaching the gospel, proclaiming his word. That's what we're doing. We're just doing what God told us to do. Uh, loggers cut trees. Do they make lumber? No. That's done at the mill. But what can the mill do without the logs? Nothing. What can the Holy Spirit do without us? It's a hard answer to say that they might just step on somebody's toes. Nothing. The Holy Spirit will do nothing without us. We are God's ambassadors, not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. He's the empowerment for us. We're the tools. He commanded us to do that. He left. And he said, you remain. You are the tools of God. You are who is called to preach the gospel, to, to do just what Jesus did in Israel. That's what we're to do, but we're to do it to the whole world. To scatter and, and bring everybody the truth. Jesus said, you are the light. You are. God is light. Why would Jesus say, you are the light? Why would he say that? Because it's true. Who else is going to bring the light into the world? We have the Spirit of God within us. We have been empowered to do just that. Okay. Now here's a, a, an example. You remember after Pentecost, Peter got up to preach. And there's several pages of his preaching in Scripture. He gave a good sermon. But he had already been baptized. Remember the tongues of fire that rested on each one of them? That was the baptism, the promise that was sent by Jesus to each one of them, empowering them to go forth into the world, just like Jesus. Remember at the river, Jesus was empowered to go out and preach the gospel. When did he receive the Holy Spirit? When he was baptized. 
Oh, wow. <laughs> Come on now. At birth. He had the Holy Spirit with him at birth. Okay? Jesus had the Holy Spirit in him all the time. All the time. From birth. Now, we don't, as homo sapiens, created beings. We receive the Holy Spirit when we're born again. When did he receive power? At the Jordan. That was the empowerment. The same with us. When we're born again, we get all excited. Now, I'm telling my story. We get all excited, and I go out the next day, and I'm preaching the gospel in a Marine Corps helicopter squadron in maintenance control. Get out of here, Mullis. Get out of here. We don't want to hear it. No power. No effectiveness. It was in vain. I had fun. <laughs> but it didn't touch anybody until I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when I started telling people about Jesus after that, I did it on the Spirit's guidance, His leading. Go talk to that person. Go say something over here. Go do that. People were touched. How many of you ever had the pleasure and the privilege of bringing someone to Jesus? Oh, oh. All right. It's Sunday. <laughs> There's a world out there that's lost. Do, do you believe this? Okay, three of you. Do you believe this? Yes. Is it true? Yes. There's the trick one. Do you obey it? Yes. Can you obey it completely? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. you can. Remember the scripture that Hank read to us this morning? He said, yeah, he said, be ye perfect. There's another scripture that says, Jesus wouldn't tell us to do something, this is my own paraphrase, that we were unable to do. He wouldn't give us a command that we couldn't accomplish. He would give us an, a, a command that we could accomplish only through him. Be perfect. We can't do that on our own. We just can't do it. I've tried. I was a Marine's Marine. <laughs> worth nothing. It's worth nothing. When Jesus took over my life, my life changed. It's like getting hit with a logging truck that's full. It changes your life. You can't help it. God is bigger than a logging truck. When you have a, a, a situation or a relationship with God, your life will change. It's got to come out somewhere. Let it be in your service to him. We go through scripture and we see all of these different things uh, that we're supposed to do and not supposed to do. There's, actually, there's only one thing that we really need to do that's hard for us to do. And that's love your neighbor as yourself. That's probably the hardest thing for us to do. Love your neighbor as yourself. Loving our enemy, is, that's, not, that's not too hard. That's really not harder than loving your neighbor. Because you don't know your neighbor. You don't know him yet. You don't know her yet. Your neighbor is whoever you talk to. The neighbor is someone who lives next door. You live next door to Angola. You live next door to China. How do I know that? They're here. There are Chinese folks here. There are Angolese here. These folks are all around us. They are our neighbor. The world is so much smaller today than it used to be. Our neighbors are the world. Love your neighbor as yourself. You love yourself so much, you feed yourself, you clothe yourself, you have a home that shelters you. You take care of you. You take care of those immediately around you, your wife, your children, that sort of thing, husband. Well, Jesus said, that's not enough. 
Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to all creation. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's the hard part. Making disciples. We forget that part. And that's what we do here. Sunday mornings, Sunday schools, Bible studies. This is where we make disciples. When you bring someone to Christ, it's almost your responsibility to take them under your wing and train them. Teach them. Well, I don't know anything. Teach them that, that you're ignorant. That's an honest teaching. I don't know. Let's search together. What I told you about Jesus, that's as much as I know. And it's enough for your salvation. But let's get to know him a little bit better. Amen. And better. And better. And better. Until the day he comes back. You can't get it all. You can't learn it all. I've been told that some folks have. They've got it all. They know it all. <laughs> Unfortunately, they weren't teaching anybody anything. So there was something lacking in their education. So all of these uh, sermons that, that Chuck's been given about service and uh, being led by the Holy Spirit and listening to the Holy Spirit and doing the work of Christ and going forth into the, into the nations, going out into our communities and talking to Christ. This is what we're called to do. That's what Christianity is all about, sharing God, serving God. Why were you created? That's scripture. The answer is right in scripture. Why were you created? For his good pleasure. Not yours. His good. We were created for his good pleasure. That's in scripture. You are a slave. You are a created being. Agree or not, that's what you are. You are a servant. You are owned. Guess what? That's a good thing. Amen. That is a good thing. We have been bought with a price. We are now owned by God. We are, your song, we are His. We belong to Him. Beforehand, we belong to the enemy. We belong to the world. We belong to death. No longer. We now belong to life and the light of the world. Each one of us is called to proclaim that. You know, maybe you don't know all of that. That's okay. Maybe you don't know that much. Of all of that, that's okay. If you know that much and you have been empowered by God, you can change the world. You can change the world. You are the light of the earth, the salt of the earth. You are his. You are his ambassadors. You are his servants. He empowers empowered you if you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's kind of the key to this whole thing today is, is that empowerment. Are you working under God's empowerment and his direction or are you doing it on your own, in your own self? And a little story that I'll, I'll try to remember, I can't remember all of it. There was a Baptist minister who went to India. There was a book uh, that I read, a very, very powerful book about his experience he wasn't even saved. And he was a Baptist minister. He got to India and he found out that he wasn't even saved. He found out what salvation was all about. So he got saved. And then there was a problem. It still was ineffective. Then he received word about this baptism of the Holy Spirit. He's researching it and, and finding out about it. And he said, okay, let's do that. So he did that. Church grew, church grew, church grew, and just kept growing. And then it started spreading. It was satellite churches all over the place. The word started going out in power, in power. 
The Lord told him one time, he said, go back to London, which is where he was from. And he said, Lord, I don't have any money. I said, I didn't ask if you had any money. I said, go back to London. <laughs> so he goes to the airport and he says, Lord, here I am. I'm in line. No money, no ticket. <laughs> There's a guy in front of him who, for some reason, something changed his mind. He turned around, the ticket to London, and gave it to him and says, here, I'm told to give this to you. I can't go any further, and he, and he leaves. And there's the preacher standing there with a ticket to London and no money. <laughs> when you respond to God and his commands empower, it'll be effective. It will touch people's hearts. You may not see it. You may not uh, have the privilege of sharing in the harvest right then. You'll share later, but right then you may not see it. Trust that God knows what he's doing. He knows. He knows that your word, spoken to her, will get spoken to him, and it'll get spoken to her, and go to her, and she will bring thousands to Christ through 12 baskets ministry. We don't know it all. All we know is God said, go speak to that person. And if you've never heard God speak to you, then you've got to start praying. If you have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, get it. Ask him for it. If You remember the scripture that says, if a, man, a child asks for a, a, a loaf of bread, will they give him a stone? No. And then there's several others in there. How much more will your father give of the Holy Spirit if you ask him? Ask him. If you don't know what it is, ask him. Ask him. He'll tell you. If you need some assistance, see me afterwards. We'll talk, talk about it and chat it up. Okay? I've seen services where folks were, were told, come up to the front, everybody come up to the front, and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So they all come up, and they, they were prayed on, went down like that, and... The next thing I know is somebody's coming up wanting me to speak in tongues. What? Who are you to tell me to speak in tongues? God didn't say speak in tongues. Not that I don't believe in that. But too many people put that emphasis on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What did Jesus put with the purpose of receiving this Holy Spirit? Power to do what? Witness. You are my witnesses. That's why you're empowered by the Holy Spirit, to be his witnesses. Well, be his witness. Testify to the truth and to the light. Okay? I know this is kind of short, but that's the way I am. I'm sorry. Are there any questions or comments or other scriptures, something that is in your heart and in your mind right now? Yes. The, um, the end of Matthew, uh -huh. Yes, yes. Excellent scripture. He, he goes into the, the three um, commands that he gives when he leaves. Preach, baptize, and teach. Okay? And in so doing, you will be walking in obedience to God. We teach them all that we know. If you only know that much, teach it. Because somebody doesn't know it. And you're going to give it to them. Yes. Any?
Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Really Amen. Yeah. Amen. I don't know about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I know how to get saved. <laughs> and I know why. I know that much. Anything else?